The simple question, which is unanswerable, is what does the Fed do in reaction to these sorts of numbers? Do they find this as good news or bad news as they try to fight inflation? It's a sort of medium. I mean, they it's bad news in the sense they probably got more work to do on the tightening front. It's good news that they haven't crashed the economy. At least there's no evidence that they've done it yet. Um, so it's, you know, there's a kind of tension between those two, and they that, that's, the, that's the line they're trying to to walk along. Does the Fed have the tools it needs to address inflation? You have a piece out on Project Syndicate that suggests that there are larger forces than just temporary ones. There are secular or st uh, structural forces, particularly lack of uh, capacity. Yeah, no, I mean, there's been a fundamental sort of structural shift in the global economy. Some of those things are transitory, but, you know, the world in which we had very strong deflationary pressures, you know, from just endless supplies of uh, tradable goods coming from emerging economies. Those days are fading, if not over. So the Fed is going to have to be more careful about inflation in the future. If, you know, if a combination of fiscal and monetary policy, it gets pretty aggressive, we'll get inflation now where we used to just get higher asset prices. We went, you know, for two decades with almost no signs of inflation in spite of huge amounts of liquidity injections and, and all that stuff, David. And, oh. Well, in your piece, you suggest that's in part because we could bring on more capacity that was underutilized, and we sort of, up, my right. primitive words, we're running out of that. That's Is right. Is there anything we can do to create more capacity to relieve some of the inflation? Oh, absolutely. Bring more people into the labor force. And but the but the best way is a big productivity surge, which you know, with digital and other tools, we might be able to engineer. Now, question: Is it going to happen fast enough to 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 sort of help the Fed out of the challenge of cutting demand down to, to get, eliminate the inflation rate? No, it won't. But longer term, uh, it's part of the solution. So we've had a fair amount of digital transformation already. Right. Uh, may, we may not be done with it, but there's been a lot of transformation. Has it showed up in productivity? No. My, it, sorry, a slightly more nuanced answer. We had a surge of productivity that was digitally related at the end of the 90s and into the early 2000s. But the recent trends in productivity are distinctly down, you know, word in productivity growth or downward and so we have not seen an upturn yet that looks you know to have any power in it and so i would say for optimists like me it's in the future for other people who are skeptics it ain't going to come is it possible we're just not measuring productivity the right way some people have suggested that oh yeah absolutely i um, mean so, so the, these powerful technologies whether they're digital or biomedical and life sciences are going to affect you know a whole range of things quality of health care, longevity, you know, et cetera. And they're not just captured in standard, you know, national income accounts. So, yeah, I mean, we could get an awful lot of progress that people care about in a lot of areas without sort of seeing the, 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 econ the standard economic effect. We tend to be a little uh, U.S. centric uh, here right. in New York. I know. But it, as you talk about some of these phenomena, it strikes me it's not limited to the United States. I no. mean, certainly you see this in Europe. And by the way, we've just had the 20th Party Congress over in China. Right. And I, I think President Xi has some challenges on both the demographics with the size of his workforce as well as the productivity. Oh, yeah. No, he's, I mean, he's got a huge challenge. He's got, uh, you know, f a floundering real estate sector. Uh, he's got the demographic challenge. He will not back off on the zero COVID, which is holding the economy down, and to some extent, the, you know, the whole, you know, global trading system. And finally, he has to sort of restore the confidence in the uh, private sector because they got hit pretty hard uh, when they decided to go on a pretty heavy-handed regulatory adventure two or three years ago. So, yeah, I mean, at le an economic and growth and development, and he's got to do it in a world where there's rising tensions, and he has other items on the agenda, uh, j not just economic development. So to come back here to the United States, are there things that the government could do to help on the productivity front? And let me give you an example. For example, through tax policy to encourage more in corporate investment. Yes, yeah, and I think, you know, they actually started. Um, you know, we had an infrastructure bill. You know, we have the investment in the, the sustainability, the so-called inflation. Reduction whatever. Act, yeah. Yeah, Reduction <laughs> Act. I don't know where they get these names from. <laughs> and, um, and the CHIPS Act is not all targeted at that, but it's, it's partly resilience and it's, and it's partly, you know, making us independent of China and Asia. But there's elements of it. And, and yes, tax policy deserves to be in the mix. If you want to 
if you want to encourage, you know, Darren Asimoglu at, at MIT says if you want to encourage, you know, productivity enhancing digital investments that go along with people, you know, the so-called augmentation effect, then then shift the tax system in such a way that you move in that direction. Tax policy is one issue. What about trade policy? Uh, it strikes me, again, going back to U.S.-China, we might be able to help both of us if we don't have quite as many uh, barriers to trade. Yeah, I mean, that's clearly right. On the, on the other hand, I think there's enough shocks in the world coming from climate, coming from pandemics, coming from wars, coming from the geopolitical tensions that, that you just referred to. I don't think we can reverse this pattern of, of diversification. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, private sector is going to go down that road. Public policy is going to help, you know, push us down that road. You can see this, David, in Europe. We, we have a very high-speed energy transition that we need to do to take us away from dependence on, uh, on Russian oil and gas. So we're not going to reverse that, and it's going to be more expensive, uh, I think. I mean, is, is that transformation driven by climate that I think the world is slowly coming to a consensus on? Right. Is it inherently inflationary? No. I mean, maybe in the short run. Look, at here's the problem that I see in that area. But longer term, the answer is a clear no, right? It's just a different pattern. It's a different growth model, if you like. It's a different economic model. Um, but in the short run, the estimates are that you need in north of $3 trillion of incremental investment globally to get this done. And so then you st stand back and look at the world we're living in. We have high, higher sovereign debt ratios. Some of that, you know, maybe 40, 50 percent is public investment. Uh, we've got high sovereign debt ratios, rising interest rates, declining fiscal capacity. And you have to ask yourself the question, how are we going to do that? And probably it's not going to be with a pile of incremental debt. As we develop economic policy, what is the role of markets in telling decision makers what they should be doing? We just saw in the United Kingdom an attempt at a different approach to economic policy. The markets firmly rejected and they had to back down in the government. On the other hand, you have President Xi who has his approach. That the markets don't like very much as of right now either. Don't. I don't think he's backing down. So what is the proper role of decision makers in paying attention to markets getting signals about their economic policy? I mean, to me, the market signals are, you know, they're not definitive, but they're crucial. I mean, you ignore them at your peril. Um, and, you know, if, if they'd ignored the, the, look, maybe the pension funds, you know, got a little bit over their skis, you know, and helped contribute to the, the kind of snar snafu that the central bank in, in England had to kind of come in and deal with, reversing their sort of general direction on, on inflation. Um, but no, market signals are absolutely crucial. You know, so I think what you're seeing in Asia is continued uncertainty about the commitment to growth and development in China. You know, worries about COVID, worries about opening up. I'm not saying that China, you know, at this stage, we all know it's going to go in the wrong direction. But markets also re react badly to excesses of uncertainty, and I think we're seeing that. Okay, bring it back to the United States. One last question here. Sure. Uh, if you're a decision maker in Washington right now, whether it's the Federal Reserve or you're at the U.S. Treasury, what signals should we be taking out of the markets? Because the markets are not very happy at the moment. No, I know. But uh, so my interpretation of what, what's going on in the markets is we're having an asset price reset. Part of that is just a function of sort of overvaluations because of projections of the pandemic-related accelerations, especially in the growth stocks and digital. And so we shouldn't worry about that. It's just going to happen. There'll be a little pain associated with it, but it's not fatal. Um, then, So I think, you know, probably they should be worried most about a serious overshoot, right, that would sort of start to affect it. The other, the other two components of this, David, are, we, you know, the discount rates going up. Everybody knows this. That affects the growth stocks more because the outbound, the out, you know, more distant earnings are worth less. And, and then there's concerns about growth. I think that I put that third because it's not the big deal. I, I think they should worry mainly, uh, and I think they do worry mainly, when you're withdrawing liquidity, you have to be careful that you don't get lockups, you know, mm -hmm. like real market, you know, non-functionality in various places, as we started to see in Britain. That, that's what I think they're probably most worried about. 